So hello everyone, or at least everyone who returned from the break. Now we are moving on to the gender relations and law and gender in the modern age. So on the one hand, we're getting closer to present day, closer to subjects that will be easier to understand and to connect to from today's perspective. <clears throat> And we are also uh, approaching a period where there is a greater division between legislation. So it's no longer uh, so simple to speak about Western European and Eastern European laws, etc. So we decided to structure this lecture just the same as we did uh, with our chapter in the textbook in a slightly different way. So we won't go uh, from legal system to legal system because on the one hand, there are more individual legal systems that we have good knowledge of. And on the other hand, the common themes are more present. It's no longer so regional or related to families of laws. There are, of course, still numerous individual differences, but we thought it better to structure this one in relation to uh, individual areas of the law, and then we'll give examples from different legislation. Um, so, the first sphere that we uh, approach is the private sphere, the one in which women had at least some rights even in the um, ancient history and Middle Ages. And it's interesting that as modernity progresses, particularly in the West and in the countries that are influenced by Western Europe and Northern America, and there are more and more of them due on the one hand to colonialism and on the other hand to the increasing modernization of Western Europe, which showcases it as a good role model for legal transplants, whether or not it was always really good uh, is, of course, a matter for debate. Um, so we see that uh, a woman's rights inside the family are even somewhat limited in this period, uh, and that particularly the rights of the husband and father are stressed more and more in some laws. Now, that should not be taken in the ancient sense. So we no longer have a pater familias who has the jus vitae acnesis over his family members. But we do have a world in which law plays an increased role. There are more and more and more complex legal transactions taking place every day. There are more and more ways in which one could be engaged as a professional, build a career, etc. And women are increasingly being pushed away from that side into uh, just the home and the family where their husband tells them what to do. Again, I am simplifying. This is uh, speaking of the average Western European bourgeois family. It would be much, much different for a peasant woman working in the field somewhere and yet different in uh, a different way for, for a female member of the English aristocracy. But generally, the husband is the head of the family in all the modern European civil codes that we see. We have a strictly patriarchal family. And now, of course, uh, various reasons are given for that, uh, from uh, the fact that Napoleon was very patriarchal, he came from Corsica, he wanted to be the boss in the, his marriage with Josephine, etc., etc., to simply the legal tradition of the country in question, the fact that all lawmakers were male, and so on. Mm, but the standard is thus uh, a citizen family 
a small nuclear family of a husband, wife, and children, where the husband gets to determine what life looks like. Uh, the woman has usually limited legal capacity while she is married. That can be to a greater or lesser extent, but at least for uh, the more important legal transactions and in some codes for all of them, she needs her husband's approval. So she sort of reverts to a, the status of a minor when she enters a marriage. <clears throat> And the husband also gets to make all the decisions uh, regarding the family as a whole. So where the family will live, it goes without question that the wife will take the husband's family name. Uh, the husband decides generally how the children will be brought up, educated, and so on. Uh, so generally, uh, the mother is considered to be are more suitable for the raising of babies and very young children where they when they still primarily need motherly love and physical care but when it comes to upbringing the children as uh, grown persons as citizens as uh, people who have to take their own path in the world, the husband, the father of the children, is considered to be the person who gets to make the decisions on that. <clears throat> the property status of married women also varies. Uh, in most countries of the uh, civil law system, so in continental Europe, married women could have their own property, but there were usually restrictions uh, to their uh, ability to make any valid transactions without their husband's approval, while in common law, as we mentioned in the Middle Ages, it stays the same, <coughs> so the husband becomes the owner of uh, the wife's property, and that is gradually changed from the mid-19th century onwards uh, with a line of married women's property acts. So it wasn't just this one from 82, but this is the most important one where married women were finally allowed to actually keep their own property. So we could say that English law in the late 19th century came more or less to the face that Islam brought to Arabia in the 7th century. Naturally, there are many, many differences. Uh, this shouldn't be taken at face value, but regarding women's property in some countries, women, particularly married women, were very limited in this respect. <clears throat> regarding inheritance, we have mixed uh, experiences. Some of these civil codes uh, grant equal inheritance rights to male and female children and other relatives, while some give priority to males. Um, generally, it must be noted that the customs of a certain place also play a very big role in practice, regardless of what the explicit norm in uh, the code is, uh, but also, of course, they influence the creation of the code itself. Mm -hmm. Now, as we said previously, uh, there are many legal transplants in this period. There were some even in, in the antiquity, of course. We all know of the hypothesis whether the Gorton Code influenced the law of the Twelve Tables, etc. Uh, but simply in the modern age, it becomes very simple to get access to a foreign legal code and interpretations and scholarly texts uh, that speak of it. Uh, particularly lawyers from smaller, less influential countries were frequently educated abroad and then already came to form their attitudes towards a certain foreign law because they studied there and then they simply brought that experience to practice um, in 
in their country of origin when they appeared as lawmakers. And we gave two classic examples from uh, Eastern Europe here. So one is the Serbian Civil Code of 1844, which was based for the most part on the Austrian one, with some influence of the French Code, some direct influence of uh, Roman law, but also some influence of Serbian customary law, which was in turn influenced by Ottoman law. While Serbia was under Ottoman rule, you see the complex layers. Um, and uh, generally, both the Austrian and the Serbian code are very strict when it's uh, when they concern the man as the head of the family, uh, a husband's right over his wife and children, etc. But the Austrian code is egalitarian when it comes to inheritance. So sons and daughters inherit equally. And the author of the Serbian code, Jovan Hadžić, wanted to implement the same solution in Serbia, but in Serbia at the time, it was customary for male children to have preference and uh, the government opposed Hadrich's idea on multiple occasions, even um, they got uh, a questionnaire out to the people asking what it was like uh, in their part of the country and what did they think it should be like. And naturally, since only men were asked, almost all of them said, yes, men should inherit uh, before women, and that was entered into the code. So in Serbian law, we had preference for male heirs until after World War II. On the other hand, though almost a century later, we have the Turkish Civil Code of 1926, which was mostly, again, not exclusively, based on the Swiss Civil Code, which shows a much greater uh, difference between the law that was transplanted and the place where it was transplanted to. Uh, and not many um, radical changes were made to the text of the Swiss Code on paper, but again, the custom showed up in practice. So in practice, it was... Uh, highly problematic to apply many of the provisions uh, of this code, in, particularly in more rural areas where tradition held fast. And now I'm not even talking just of Turkey. Generally, we have such examples in Serbia and there are many in other countries as well, particularly in smaller rural communities that, for example, even if a code says a law of whatever status that male and female children inherit equally, uh, that there is social pressure to keep land within the male line of the family. And so sisters um, give their shares of the family inheritance to their brothers, sometimes for free, sometimes with compensation, etc. <clears throat> now, what happened if a woman needed to come to court. Generally, in those legal systems where a married woman's legal capacity was reduced, so was her procedural capacity. So if a woman could not sign a contract without her husband's consent, she could not represent herself in court, either her husband or some other male relative uh, had to do it. Mm -hmm. women were generally acceptable witnesses in most laws of the modern period. Most of them don't have any more strict uh, imperative norms forbidding women to testify or reducing the value of their testimony. However, it is noticeable in practice that, again, with the exceptions of some purely feminine matters where men aren't expected to testify at all, when we're talking about just a regular eyewitness of a crime or the witness to an orally uh, concluded contract, that uh, male witnesses are considered more reliable. So in the cases where a judge has to um, 
pass a verdict where male witnesses say one thing and female witnesses say another, the judges were more likely to put their faith with the male witnesses, sometimes stating explicitly that men were more likely to remember <coughs> this correctly because, say, they knew business while women did not, and sometimes there was implicit bias of the judge just claiming that these witnesses who just happened to be men um, seemed more trustworthy, etc. Naturally, for many old verdicts, we don't have um, very detailed descriptions, so sometimes we don't know the reason, but that's generally what the statistics show. This is a broad outline. Exceptions are, of course, possible, but we're talking about what's the most frequent um, in this period. Mm -hmm. Now, in those countries that had jury systems, which we most often associate with the common law, but there are juries in some civil law jurisdictions as well, um, it varied. In some countries, uh, women explicitly legally could not serve as jurors. In some, they were gradually admitted. Uh, but when we see the practice again, either uh, much fewer women were even invited to jury duty or, uh, you know, that you have jury selection in common law countries, the lawyers were more likely to opt for male jurors. And there are also, of course, instances where women who were invited to jury duty declined. Sometimes they could not get the permission for, from their husbands. Sometimes maybe other reasons were involved. Some of them might genuinely not have felt ready. Some of them might have been embarrassed to appear in such a way in public. So again, we have the legal uh, causes, but we also have simply the social position. Now, how is it with women in professional legal roles? You remember the example that Boyan Spaich gave on the very first lecture, how it was much easier for women uh, to uh, get access to legal education than to actually practicing law. So, of course, university education was at first seen as a male thing. But starting with, say, the early 19th, particularly the middle of the 19th century, many universities opened their doors to women. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that they opened their doors to women equally. Many universities, even in the USA, had uh, very limited quotas uh, for men, uh, for women as opposed to men, uh, even in the second half of the 20th century. So um, I remember when we watched the documentary about Ruth Bader yeah. Ginsburg, who was at Harvard, I, I think, think Harvard. or maybe it was, it was a, it it was a very prestigious university. U.S. university. It was yes, yes, yes. Uh, it was uh, maybe three years ago. No, but w w what university did she study at? Do you remember? But it was a prestigious uh, U.S. law school. So, say in the '60s, and yeah. and they had a quota of one fifth to for women. So only twenty percent of their students could legally be women. And I, if I remember, and she, yeah. Yes, the story about the dean. Yeah. And then she gives us a story in the documentary how mm, when they entered, the dean invited all of them female students to dinner. It was a very pretty, fancy dinner. And as she speaks about it, we first think it's going to be a nice story that he's going to do something gentlemanly, but then he sat each of those female students in front of him individually and asked her to uh, give the reasons why she came and entered this faculty and occupied the place that could have been taken by a man. It was law school at Harvard, and later yes. she transferred to Columbia Law School. So that's Harvard in the 1960s. Now imagine that you're in the 
So many universities still did not accept women and or only did so exceptionally after some individual testing to see whether that girl was really good enough to study with the men. Uh, many had quotas or some extra conditions that women had to uh, fulfill to qualify. Uh, and even after that, um, uh, we have a question from Shekhriban that I only uh, noticed now, so I will reply to this when we're done with the uh, courts section. Or maybe since it's a very general question, uh, we might even leave it for the end, if you don't mind, Shekhriban. Uh, since it's a very uh, conceptual question. Was there something before it? Okay. Okay. You want to again? And uh, that, that was it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh -huh. So we'll comment on this later. Yeah. Sorry. Uh -huh. So women gained access to education. Naturally, it was slower in the more traditionally masculine professions, particularly military schools were in many countries close to women until very late in the 20th century. Uh, and, uh, but the problem is a large part of the society believed that women who came to have a higher education were just women from high society uh, that wanted that uh, education to be presentable wives and mothers and that they actually went to the university to find good husbands. So women were expected to come to study so they could marry educated husbands, uh, find husbands among their colleagues, and many people did not expect them to want to practice their profession for real. And when it came to free professions, it was sometimes simpler. You know, if a woman came to study art and she became a good painter or musician or writer, well... Of course, she could still face discrimination in her past, but she could just send her manuscript somewhere to be published. There wouldn't be any legal uh, obstacles to that. Whether a publisher wanted to publish a woman's book is a different thing. And you know that many famous female writers from the 19th century first published under male pseudonyms, for example, because it was simpler. And sometimes the publishers even knew they were women, but advised them to take a male pseudonym so the books would sell better. But uh, to return to law, the legal profession was where there were fixed rules, where there were legal obstacles to women practicing their profession. Uh, and uh, so in many jurisdictions, uh, women gained the right to study law much sooner than they gained the right to become practicing attorneys. And that again preceded the right of women to become, say, judges. Uh, also, uh, even when they gained official license to, say, be practicing attorneys, Again, we come to the factual side. They often faced discrimination. Uh, clients were less likely to hire a female attorney because they thought she'd be less competent. She wouldn't be uh, as aggressive in court, and that was seen as a good quality and as a masculine quality. Uh, they were frequently discriminated over small things such as clothes. So if they showed up dressed like a lady would wear at the time, they'd be waved off as unprofessional. That's not what a lawyer wears to court. If they'd showed up not dressed completely like a man, that would be scandalous because a woman was dressing like a man. So it was very, very hard to find a socially acceptable middle ground there. <clears throat> now, generally, when we move to criminal law, here we are at the intersection of proper criminal law and criminology. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And generally, we can see both in the past and at present, you heard some things from Ivana yesterday and you'll have criminology lectures with Natalia, I think, on Thursday. Uh, there are some crimes that are profiled as more male or more female. So, for example, violent crime is generally more a male thing. So mafia gangs are unlikely to have many female members. Uh, and there are some crimes that are traditionally male because they are connected to traditionally male functions. For example, various crimes of, of state officials against their service, such as taking a bribe, for example, were for a long time exclusively male crimes because only men were accepted to state service. A woman could show up as a party offering a bribe, but not as the official taking it. <clears throat> uh, generally, uh, there are crimes that are traditionally female, uh, where we have things such as uh, adultery that we mentioned in the previous periods, uh, we have prostitution when it is illegal, and that's a big subject, and I'm not sure we have enough time to dwell on it, but generally various laws uh, alternated between having legal prostitution, which was, of course, a disreputable but potentially profitable profession, to uh, making it illegal and imposing severe penalties, but again, usually just for prostitutes and not for their clients, and the same debate is ongoing even today, so you know that there are uh, opposing tendencies for and against the legalization of prostitution, or as it is now more fashionable to say, sex work. Sex work, yeah. <coughs> <coughs> mm. And there are... <coughs> okay, I are you okay? Are you okay? <laughs> There are also um, traditionally male and female ways of committing the same crime. Uh, so when we say, for example, of, speak of murder, we are more likely <clears throat> to find men as complete, uh, committing violent murder, while uh, a woman is more likely to... Uh, poison someone or to kill someone in their sleep, etc. And that is, again, both biologically and socially logic due to both the position of men, their access to weapons, etc., and simply to physical strength. And in some legislations, there are even provisions that have a certain gender dimension to it, but as even I told you yesterday, generally criminal law is mostly gender neutral, so the most obvious exception are sexual crimes. As you may have noticed in the older periods, we have had the crime of rape, for example, traditionally defined as a crime that a man commits against a female victim. In ancient Greece and Rome, the victim could also be a man. Again, in the Christian Middle Ages, not because uh, homosexuality of any sort, at least among men, was punishable on its own, regardless whether it was uh, consensual or not. So, uh, rape was a clearly uh, sex-defined crime, gender-defined. Uh, however, in the later period, but we're speaking of the 20th century now, we come to a gender-neutral designation in some legislation, so whoever forces someone else to sexual intercourse is committing rape by whatever means that is uh, ensured, particularly if you have a threat of some sort, so a woman could equally threaten or blackmail a man into having intercourse with her. Um, however, we still have legislations that even uh, impose different penalties. I think in the UK law, you s have sort of 
uh, something similar to a woman raping a man, but it's not considered such a severe crime uh, as a man raping a woman. Uh, and again, that's a very uh, big conceptual question, whether such a thing is justifiable. Uh, is it really always worse when direct use of force is involved, etc., etc.? <clears throat> Now, uh, coming to the more penological aspect of the equation, there were often uh, differences in the punishment of men and women for the same crime. Uh, for example, uh, prisons and the prison sentence is the dominant sentence of the uh, modern Western law. Uh, not only are prisons sex segregated, so that you have separate prisons for men and women, but prisons for men are usually uh, the ones having higher standards of security. Uh, and that is again uh, explained by the fact that men more often commit violent crimes, so you are more likely to have to uh, severely... Uh, take precautions against escape for someone who was arrested for armed robbery and murder than for someone who was arrested for forgery. Uh, and that ge generally men are physically stronger and thus more likely to uh, escape or commit further crimes in prison if there isn't sufficient security. Uh, but there are also uh, different... Um, aspects uh, of, say, the uh, execution of the death penalty. Uh, for example, in many uh, societies in the 19th century, there was the standard that even when the death penalty was executed by shooting, that was done solely for men because it was dishonorable to shoot a woman because a woman herself was not a soldier, did not bear firearms, and thus... Uh, it was simply not appropriate. A woman had to be hanged or killed by some other means. <clears throat> Let's probably not dwell on this too much. Uh, now, the, of course, we'll be ready to answer questions. There are many, many issues that can be raised in every area of law. Uh -huh. Now we come to the public sphere and to the subject that is usually considered to be the most interesting one, at least to lay people. So when you say uh, law and gender and legal history, people usually think of the fight for female suffrage. Uh, so uh, I have to underline that while this was the most obvious fight, the most public fight, let's say it, it was not the only one. So, in parallel, while we did have the fight for female suffrage, we also had the fight, for example, for the improvement of the status of women within the family. In some cases, uh, those uh, fights were connected, so the same activists, the same women or men who considered that women should have equal rights fought for both causes, but there were uh, sometimes also conflicts between them. So some women thought that it was more important for them to get the vote because if they got the vote, they could change everything else. While some women thought that voting was more about politics <laughs> and politics was not so important uh, in their everyday lives. What they wanted was a better position in the house, in the family, in the work, if they were employed, so that such things were more important for them. <clears throat> now, generally, every suffrage movement had its peculiarities, and we could probably hold a lecture regarding the fight for female suffrage in any individual country. You probably know the most important roles, uh, some prominent women from at least some countries, be it uh, the early pioneer in France, Olympe de Gouges, that was also mentioned in the theory lectures, who in the end uh, 
got guillotined not just for rewriting the Declaration on the Rights of Women and the Citizeness. How would we put it in English? Yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> female, female citizens. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, the, the Pankhursts in England, uh, various uh, important women who uh, fought for suffrage in very different ways. Now, that's important. You have uh generally the more conservative uh, stream of suffragist movements that were just lobbying for female suffrage uh that were holding public lectures meetings trying to connect to male politicians who might see their fight in a sympathetic way uh and you had those militant suffragists who would try to uh, make very, very public shows of um, their discontent to try to sort of uh, force the male decision makers to grant them the suffrage. Of course, the fight in England is probably the most prominent. There are many movies made about it and so on. Sometimes you had different generations in the same country For example, in the USA, you have the old suffragist movement that was generally linked to the temperance movement. Uh, it was all uh, respectably dressed older white ladies who were uh, giving peaceful talks about why women should have suffrage. And then you had the young generation that got some experience from Uh, the suffragists in England who wanted to uh, make big public demonstrations in front of the White House to go on hunger strikes like their colleagues did in England, etc., etc. Fighting mm -hmm. with police officers, physically yes, with yes. clubs, <laughs> uh, throwing their, themselves in front of royal horses. And <laughs> that's, that's a very extreme <laughs> That's a very extreme example, way yeah. of fighting, but they were very radical. And similar here, you had uh, in Serbia, for example, the older intellectual women who were generally writing some articles how it, the women should get vote, and sometimes they uh, have civilized academic talks with their male colleagues, and then you have the women in the communist movement who were all about fighting for your rights very physically with the armed force if necessary. <clears throat> Uh, generally, uh, you can see that the, the pioneer here isn't some uh, developed Western European country, as people might expect. So the first country that gained full gave full suffrage to women was New Zealand, and that was the end of the 19th century. Uh, and then generally, uh, we had a wave of enfranchisement In the beginning of the 20th century, a lot of it after World War I, then generally quiet, and the second big wave after World War II. Why? Why were wars so important? Because they gave an unfortunate opportunity for women to step up in traditionally male roles. Because as many men went away to fight in the wars, there were many uh, vacant spots that needed to be occupied, both for the civilian part of the country to function if it wasn't directly in a war zone, but also to prepare for the front, so the production of weapons, ammunition, uniforms, and all other military supplies required a lot of factory workers and Since most men were at the front, many of those workers were women. And then sometimes, regardless of whether there had been a strong suffrage movement in the country previously, after the war, uh, many countries gave the women suffrage. And there's a lot of uh, tension uh, between researchers of the history of suffrage rights whether uh, the wars should be given real significance there. So what was more important, the previous suffrage movement or what happened in the war? There are those who say that nothing would have happened 
had there not been a political movement before, there's those who disdain that and say that the women just got lucky with the war. Uh, so, yes, th- th- that would be a very unusual sort of luck, but you know what I mean. <laughs> th- 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 there are some authors who yeah, almost yeah. explicitly put it that way. <laughs> I am not going to say where there are more male and female authors. Uh, so, um, uh, this is... Uh, a subject that can probably uh, never be uh, fully explored in the sense that we can say directly, ah, these were directly the reasons, and I don't know, the war effort contributed so many percent, and the suffrage movement so many percent. So it's always very uh, complex when discussing the reasons of some changes in social life. Now, another big factor that we have uh, still is religion. But we have to keep in mind that a lot of the world, particularly the Western world, is growing increasingly secular in the modern era. Uh, So, uh, on the one hand, uh, we have societies that are still very traditional, that uh, still have a similar role of their main church or religious community uh, as there was in the Middle Ages. And on the other hand, we have societies that are almost militantly secular, that go for the full separation of church and state, and that where the positive law of the state doesn't care much what religion has to say on many accounts, including gender relations. And of course, many societies are somewhere in between. So for example, if you have a country where both uh, civil and religious marriage are valid, you may find yourself in the situation uh, that you have the same marriage uh, uh, before the eyes of the law, whether you conclude it in some clerk's office or in a church, uh, but that the conditions for entering into such a marriage will vary because the church or the religious community uh, will uh, impose uh, different, um, different rules on, say, concluding a marriage, Uh, There may be different rules for divorce. For example, uh, we naturally have uh, secular divorce in most Western countries today, but many of them are still dominantly Catholic. And as you know, uh, the Catholic Church uh, does not officially allow divorce at all. So there is an institution called the separation from the bed and the table, which means that the couple is no longer expected to live together, so to to sleep together and eat together to be in the same household. They can live their own separate lives, but they are not um, allowed to marry anyone else. Uh, And... In some countries where you had religious pluralism before secular marriages were allowed, you had a lot of um, conflict and sometimes uh, evading the laws uh, based on supposed uh, religious beliefs. For example, in the interwar Yugoslavia, so the big old kingdom of Yugoslavia, where you had large Orthodox Christian, Catholic, and Muslim communities. There were, of course, also Protestants and Jews, but these three were the largest. Given the fact that there were very different rules for marriage and divorce, and in the largest part of the country there was no secular marriage, you'd have cases uh, such that a Catholic Uh, decides that he has felt the genuine urge to convert to Islam uh, and he becomes a Muslim and then divorces his wife very, very simply because according to Sharia law, a man can divorce his wife with a simple statement, no particular 
uh, long procedure grounds are needed. And then two weeks later, he suddenly has a bout of guilt and returns to the Catholic faith. But of course, his marriage is already divorced because he was a Muslim uh, at the point when the divorce took place. Uh, so uh, generally, uh, a mixed world uh where you have conflicts between various religions, but for the most part, no longer active warfare as we've had in the Middle Ages, and where you have increasing um, interactions between the religious and the atheist members of society, uh, simply puts law in an unusual position and different solutions were uh, given in different laws. Uh, naturally, the socialist and communist uh, countries are a different extreme. They are the example of a drastically anti-religious society where for a while, uh, depending on the country, even any form of religious marriage was banned, the public professions of faith were not allowed, etc. But again, this is a generalization. It very much depends on the country and on the period. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what you have on the slide is the are some remarks uh, based on what Professor Pietro Loyacono uh, wrote for our textbook regarding the churches. So uh, don't be surprised that the majority of it is about the Catholic Church because he's an Italian professor and that's uh, the, the main law that he's concerned with. Uh, but generally, uh, the, both the Orthodox and the Catholic Church are more... Uh, traditional when it comes to gender roles in the church, and uh, there is more variation in various Protestant communities, including uh, relatively early rights of women to join the clergy, etc., in some of the Protestant communities, while in some that is a very hot and contested topic. It's uh, generally similar in Judaism as well. So there are some places where women can be ordered as rabbis, where there are uh, schools that consider that uh, completely heretic. There are also interesting examples, a bit more modern ones. Now, I cannot remember the exact uh, names or dates, but it, it's very contemporary. Um, it's a case that ended in front of the court, uh, European Court for Human Rights, and it's actually, it's, it's very interesting. Um, and the problem arose in Greece. So um, a, a woman, she was Muslim. Her uh, husband passed. And according to Greek laws, she was to inherit everything. Uh, but then the husband's sisters said that according to Sharia law, you know, division of property should go otherwise. And it was a long legal battle for a wife how and you know courts really uh, were had a difficult time um, kind of um uh on the one hand enforcing secular law on the other hand accepting the difference that there are different regulations within a muslim community and then eventually it ended in front of the european court for human rights i think it ruled in favor of the wife but that it it just uh, portrays the difficulties of um uh Enforcing law in multicultural and multi-religious societies, especially when we come to we talk about religions that don't really under, uh, recognize like physical borders, mm. like Sharia law is very, how to say, um, there's a personal application to it. You can be in whatever country as a Muslim, it's applied to you and it may not be um, in agreement with the secular law in the country the Muslims living in. So it, it's very complex. Yes, issue. generally... Um Religion is a personal status and the members of the religious community will always say, well, that they have to follow their own rules regardless of where they are, whether that country is secular or not, etc. And that might be a very a good example of the old uh, personal application yeah. of law still being to some extent 
valid today yeah. because if we remember some periods in the antiquity or middle ages that was the standard Germanic you know, law was yes you personal. were born as a Frank and you had to obey Frankish law Wherever regardless you are. where exactly. you are <laughs> so uh, the religion still retains that aspect today at least to some extent now there is also a very big and important subject of the dark legacy of colonialism and of the differences in not just uh, class and sex or gender, but also race or ethnic origin in the status of individuals in the modern world. So, of course, uh, we could say that even the people in the um, antiquity could, to some extent, be racist in the sense that they uh, <laughs> felt their superiority towards others. Uh, but as the communities were smaller at the time, it was more often us against everyone else. So the Athenians for, were, for example, uh, very, very uh, restrictive when it came to foreigners, but the, those were any sort of foreigners. Of course, it was even worse if it was a barbarian and not a Greek, uh, but uh, the racial element was not present in uh, to, to such an extent. Uh, it is the col colonialization of the greater part of the world by Western European powers that really brought to us the sort of racism with the legacy of which we are still fighting today. <clears throat> and generally, uh, we have uh, in those cases... Uh, on the one hand, when a col white colonial power comes to some African or Asian country, they try to impose their uh, laws, their uh, way of thinking as superior. Um, and then uh, we have a very interesting dynamic of that uh, with gender relations. So the colonial powers... Uh, did not really have a consistent uh, attitude that they applied towards the peoples in the colonies. They applied what was more suitable for them. So if they uh, naturally, they always had the attitude that their law was superior and the local law inferior, but sometimes they would say, well, this local law is inferior and terrible and we have to abolish it and replace it with our laws. And some, sometimes they would say, well, yes, it's inferior and terrible, but those people are inferior and terrible and those laws are the only ones that are suited for them, so we'll keep enforcing them. How they call them sav savages, that's the distinct the term. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, what we have there is that although the colonial powers saw themselves as advanced, it is often uh, they who brought an increase in gender inequality to the colonized countries uh, because they imposed their point of view or because they simply did not understand uh, and did not really wish to understand uh, native laws. In Africa, for example, um, um, there might have been ethnologists and the like studying native customs, but the colonial government did, didn't really care about that too much. And, uh, for example, while naturally traditional African society is also patriarchal, the man was head of the family in most places, marriage was polygamous and so on, uh, there was still uh, relative equality in the division of spheres uh, of uh, agriculture, trade, uh, crafts, etc. Uh, so there were, for example, crops that were traditionally cultivated by men and crops that were traditionally cultivated by women. And although the male ones were considered a little more prestigious, both of them had relevant roles. 
uh, when the white colonizers came, they only focus on men as people who do agriculture and trade and commerce, because that's what they think society should be like. Uh, and then they give some incentives to men engaging in such activities while they push women to the side. So men, for example, gain access to uh, better education, to uh, more modern tools, uh, various means of improving their agriculture, while women are pushed away from the market, from owning the land, and thus gender inequality is drastically spread. There is also a frequent uh, example of the gender stereotyping uh, of uh, natives in the land the colonialists came to. So you all know the Orientalist stereotype of the seductive Oriental woman, for example. Mm. Uh, uh, you know the uh, stereotype that was widespread in the slavery United States and survives to this day of the dangerous, psychotic black man who is a violent, a murderer, a rapist, etc. The stereotype that was spread throughout the U.S. society in the 18th and 19th century. Uh, or, uh, for example, in British India, the stereotype of... Uh, native Hindu men as being weak and effeminate while the British men were proper examples of masculinity, etc., etc., that also uh, complicates things. <clears throat> and then uh, when you have um, the colonial power fighting against some sort of custom... <coughs> you may have backlash enforcing that custom because the evil colonialists are trying to destroy our customs. A very good example is, for example, the practice of sati in mm. India. Mm. So you know what it is? It is the custom uh, for a widow to willingly commit suicide when her husband dies. She is usually either burned with him at the funeral pyre or she previously takes some sort of poison and then they are buried together, etc. Uh, sati existed in colonial India, but it was a very rare occurrence. It was something that uh, only individual women resorted to, women from uh, families of very high standing. So it was considered an ultimate form of wifely devotion and sacrifice, one that brought great prestige to the woman and to the family, but not something every widow committed when her husband died. And when the British powers intervened, uh, trying to ban sati completely as a barbaric custom, then the traditional community responded, they are trying to destroy our custom. And many, many more cases of sati showed up because... Some women felt the urge to do it themselves to stay true to tradition. Some might have been pressured by their family members. But either way, uh, the, the custom was not suppressed. It was, in fact, spread for a while. <clears throat> so, generally, uh, perhaps the most uh, famous forms of uh, combined... Uh, racial and gender discrimination uh, are present in the law of the United States, where you know that even after the abolition of slavery, uh, there was a very, uh, very distinct racial segregation um, and many both laws discriminating against black citizens and discriminatory practice, even where laws uh, were equal, took place, but we shouldn't uh, forget that it was not just the United States, that we had such cases in many other countries, both in countries in Asia and Africa, Latin America, that were conquered by white colonizers, but also in the countries in Europe, which, due to their colonial past, 
started getting a flow of immigration of people from those countries. Uh, so you know that there are, for example, many black people and Arabs in France right now. Uh, and if you look at the uh, legal history of France or England in the 19th and early 20th century, you might think there weren't any back then because no racial issues are mentioned at all. But if you dig deeper, if you look into the sources, you will see that the population was very, very big even in that period and that there were many cases of racial discrimination and then we come to the intersectionality and multiple discrimination. So if you're in a society where it's better to be a man than a woman and it's better to be white than to be black, then it's doubly bad to be a black woman, etc., etc. And again, there were movements for equality. But those movements sometimes work together, but sometimes were <coughs> conflicted. So, for example, in the U.S., you had an anti-slavery movement, and after that, the movement for equal rights of blacks with whites, and you had the female suffrage movement, and those movements sometimes collaborated, but there were also uh, clashes between them, and... Um, you know that there were scandals, for example, when the, um, the female suffrage movement in the U.S. organized the big parade because they forced the black members to be out in the back separately because they thought that um, their main base, the white women, will be shocked if they saw black women marching along with their members. And those are just some milder examples. And again, it does not have to be race. It can be class. It was uh, similar with the suffrage movement and uh, the fight for the rights of poor working women. The fancy noble ladies, or not noble if we're in the US, for example, <laughs> but the fancy rich ladies who wanted to fight for suffrage but were otherwise pretty well off in life, simply did not want to listen to the problems of poor working women and their complaints and their attempts to join forces were often met with scoldings. Well, that's not a women's issue, that's a workers' issue. You know, it's your problem that you're a worker that has nothing to do with the fact that you're a woman. Um, and that's why um, such movements often multiplied and different branches uh, were uh, spread. For You have uh, the example of black feminism. The, the word womanism was also used. So by feminists of color in the United States mostly, to distinguish themselves from the feminism of upper-class white women who simply did not want to hear their plights and did not want to uh, help in those parts of the fight that were important to different types of women, to women of different class, race, religion, and so on. I would stop here. There are many other issues that we could open, uh, but maybe it is better to leave more time for our discussion. And we already had some comments and uh, questions in the chat, so I will read them out now. I can close the participants yes, just yes. for a second. So, yeah. uh, so uh, during the break, we had even an equalage comment that she just wanted to highlight that women had profitable careers as ale women or brewers, as well as gin making in England in the Middle Ages. Uh, that is correct. So from the Middle Ages and e even in the antiquity, some careers were relatively uh, available to women and they could make a living on their own, uh, particularly easier if they were widows already, because if a woman stayed single, there was always uh, the uh, 
um, implicit tarnish of her reputation because why why was she single? She was probably some sort of prostitute, immoral woman, etc. But if she was a respectable widow, particularly if she had children already from her late husband, she could more or less run her household and run her business in most societies. It was the same in ancient Greece. Elder women, widows, uh, those who had children that left the reproductive age, they were given much more agency and it was more acceptable to see them in public, actually, existing mm. as a woman, <laughs> because their morale wasn't being questioned because of it. Yeah, I see that this is still shared over see. there, so I'll just close it. So maybe you we're could still share. Yeah, see yeah, the chat. Now. Yeah, yeah, okay, great. Not sure whether you can read it, but we'll read it out loud, yeah. too. Mm. Mm. So Shekhrabun gave us a very extensive comment and question. She says, mainstream traditional historians seem to be very strict about anachronisms in history, especially when it comes to gender and women's history. For example, I'm working on femicide and I chose to use the term femicide for the murders of women in the 19th century in my master's thesis and I faced a lot of reactions. I was told that I cannot use the term femicide, but of course I did. But these historians themselves use the term class very often for the 14th, 15th centuries, although the concept of class did not exist at that time, it came much later. So I am not against it, I use it myself. I think it does no harm, I think even it makes it easier for us to understand. But this is exactly where my question starts. Don't these traditional historians contradict themselves on this point? They call it anachronism when it comes to gender and women's studies, but on other subjects they are not so much against it. So what do you think about the concept of anachronism in history in general and gender history in particular? Because if we follow these traditional historians, gender studies itself is completely anachronistic. Thank you very much for this question and comments, Shekhriban. This is really a very important thing to note. So generally, when dealing with any sort of history, and legal history is no exception, it is important to try to see it through the lenses of the time that we are studying. So, of course, we cannot completely shed what is shaping us as people who live in the 21st century, but we should always give our, do our best to attempt to watch the source material as someone who lived in the time when the sources were created, to try to understand how people who wrote that, people who applied that, people who interpreted that legal text that we're reading, regardless whether it's ancient Frieze or called Napoleon or whatever other legal system, we have to see it as they saw it. However, a theoretical framework can be of great help. So naturally, we will use concepts that did not exist in the time that we are studying. A very classical example that has nothing to do with gender, but I'll get to that too, is simply the division of law into different areas. For example, when studying legal history of any country here in Serbia, which is part of the continental legal system, we use the traditional division into public and private law, and then we divide the private or civil law into family law, law of inheritance, law of things, etc., according to the Roman model. And when we talk about the law of ancient Mesopotamia or medieval Serbia or anything, we always underline to the students, but they did not make such divisions. Sometimes it's harmful to go into the stereotypes. For example, if you're, you are in your head making a clear distinction between uh, paying someone damages as part of a civil delict, as part of the law of obligations, and getting punished for doing something as part of criminal law, while in some ancient or medieval system there was simply no difference between the two. However, <clears throat> While we must be careful when using these categories, they can help to give us the outlines of this knowledge. 
So while there was, for example, nothing called specifically family law in ancient Mesopotamia, there were laws regarding marriage, uh, the rights of spouses, of parents towards their children, etc. And we could talk about that under the title of family law. We have to say that there wasn't such a definition at that time, and thus we could not make any arguments based on the fact, well, that this is a provision of family law and this one of the law of inheritance or of criminal law, because they made no such distinctions. But if we want to study from a legal point of view how the family worked in ancient Mesopotamia, uh, then, of course, we will use the term family law. Now, when it comes to more gender-related uh, terms and more modern terms, because the term family law at least has its roots in ancient Rome. Uh, when it comes to something that was created in the 20th or 21st century and you're studying some very old law, uh, the differences will be greater. Essentially, what I think is best is to see whether there is sufficient basis um, for the thing that you are using the term for in that society. So if they did not have the word for it, but we could see it as a distinct thing, it's safe to use. If we can't see that thing, that phenomenon, that institution from the perspective of that time, then it is probably not safe to use. So you use the example of femicide. If you use it strictly in the sense in which it is properly used today, so meaning violence against women because they are women and, uh, well, the, the murder of women in this case, usually in the family, you can use the term in uh, historical research as well. If you, and I'm not now suggesting that you personally would do that, but if someone overextends the term and tries to label every act of murder where the perpetrator is a man and the victim is a woman as femicide, that's problematic. That's already an abuse of the term because if, I go across the street now and the man hits me with a car, that's not femicide. He did not kill me because I was a woman, he killed me because he was a reckless driver, and the fact that he happens to be a man and I a woman is irrelevant. So, uh, it's sim similar to what I mentioned when we were talking about hatship suit and women acting as men. Yes, that's um, uh, being shown as transgender by contemporary researchers who want to see transgender people everywhere in history. So, you know, there's the rule, if you look for something, you'll find it. If you approach uh, a text in hope that you will find uh, some uh, information regarding phenomena X, and the text has anything resembling it, you will recognize it, but that does not necessarily have to be true. Another example, for example, from uh, Africa, uh, there's an institution uh, in Africa that's usually referred to as women's marriages. So in uh, several traditional tribal African societies, there was the possibility for a woman to marry another woman, and many mid-20th century uh, Western explorers during the sexual revolution tried to say they had lesbian marriages. They had nothing of the sort. They had an economic contract where a woman, usually a mother of a deceased young man who was supposed to marry a young woman, decided to go on with the marriage despite the fact that the husband was no longer alive, or simply uh, a woman who was rich wanted to marry a younger woman essentially as workforce. So it's the fact that they used the marriage contract for a purely economic aspect where the 
woman husband would gain the economic rights to the use of the woman wife as workforce, etc. And where there may be, in some case, some lesbians making use of that, well, maybe, maybe. <laughs> but that is definitely not what the core of the institution was about. So try not to input into historical sources something that is not present in them. If you find the phenomenon in the sources, you can use a more modern word, but since there will be traditionalists who are opposed to the use of modern words, particularly if it's not uh, a long and widespread use. Almost nobody, not nobody, but many people don't object against class because everyone has been using class for decades and centuries now. If you use a term that's been coined only 10 years ago, you have more explaining to do. So perhaps in the introduction of your paper, explain that you will be using such and such term uh, to mean such and such a phenomenon and why you think this term is appropriate, and if you noticed any risks, you also mentioned them in advance and how you will try to avoid them. For example, I uh, didn't fully read, I browsed a very interesting book that came out a few years ago called Human Trafficking in the Middle Ages. That's a good example of that. Yeah. So it talks about slavery, prostitution, yeah. etc., yeah. phenomena that were very much present, but nobody used the term human, human trafficking, trafficking at modern. that time. Now, I haven't read it thoroughly, so I don't know whether the author was consistent, but if he was, I see no harm in using the term as long as we explain what we mean by it. Ivan Anikolic also wrote something, but do many of the people present in person maybe have something to say? No, then I'll read uh, Ivana's comments. So when we were talking about uh, female suffrage, even I also mentioned women gained access to many male jobs in World War I. I presume that's in line with what we concluded yeah, afterwards. Yes, so, yes, yes. so yes, it was uh, also a gain to some gain of access to some professions that were relatively close to women until then. And then it also contributed in some countries, not all, but often to the gaining of female suffrage. And then Ivana says, I would like to comment on the race aspect, highlighting that some suffragette movements were very discriminatory against black people and women, particularly stating that black men will get the vote before <coughs> white women, seeing them as lower class. Later, there were also divisions on rights of LGBTQ plus people, practically lesbians seen as predators. So the history of women's movements is filled with conflicted stances. For me, that is very bad as it div divides people into groups that fight against each other and not systemic discrimination. Uh, and... Natasha says, and again, it's happening. Now, I'm not sure whether you mean what Ivana says or that there are technical problems again because we had those two, uh, but it, it, it could be probably applied to both things. Uh, so, yes, generally, regardless of whether we take gender relations as a key point of some research or not, uh, we can see in modern society, okay, yes, Natasha mentioned on what Ivana said, and she was right, uh, so that there are many groups of people who are oppressed for some reason, because some other dominant group managed to gain the upper hand and be the majority of the establishment of the given society and thus to pass laws to determine how laws are applied and interpreted. And it is very, very difficult to come from that uh, submissive, discriminated against position to change the situation as a whole. And the grounds can be different. So it can be class, it can be race, it can be gender, religion, it can be a combination of all those factors and more. We've talked about people with disabilities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It can be national, it can be political, sexuality, etc. Anything. Yeah. And it's in the interest of those in power to divide those movements. Mm -hmm. 
to the, the, the good old DVD Timpeda, the Romans knew it all. It can be applied to internal politics as well. So if you have black people fighting for their rights and white women fighting for their rights, and you are the white men who rule the United States in the 19th century, you absolutely don't want those two groups to come together and to fight against you. If you are uh, some dominant capitalist in a neoliberal system in the 21st century, you don't want any group of your opponents converging with another, and that is why as Natasha said, it's happening again, and it will always be happening as long as some uh, small dominant minority uh, wants to keep its hegemony. They will try to divide those who fight against them and to turn them against each other. Professor Weirdo, you know it's... So that's not only the matter of those outside who tr try to divide, to make conflicts and then to divide uh, with own purposes, but internal, so that's the matter of internal different interests or the level of self-awareness, and it is also the matter of the inclusion, process of inclusion within the democratic processes. Uh, and that process of inclusion has been, or must be based, or had been based and still has been based on the struggle of the minorities for their rights. First. Those were in the, set of the, in the first suffragette movement and the second uh, wave feminist movement that was uh, the struggle of the white women. But then the critical race feminism uh, put on agenda a crucial uh, question, okay, uh, uh, white women of the middle class, they put into question uh, universalizing uh, uh, content of human rights notion, universalizing content of categories used by white uh, male-dominated political theories and legal theories, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and they said equally what women, feminists uh, within feminist theor theory and practice of the second wave, did putting into question this universalizing. Uh, approach to their experience, so the critical race feminism and color-based feminism put into question white, uh, the, the feminism of white women, and struggle put uh, make the pressure for including into the feminist discourse and uh, self-awareness raising also the issue of uh, of the gender-based discrimination based also in intersection. So they put pressure for intersectional approach. So if black women are also disabled, very poor, etc., etc., they are not only subordinated to, to their black partners and black community, but also even more. So that intersectional approach in the feminist uh, discourse and understanding of these gender-based issue, issues went further, uh, had, to, uh, had become advanced due to the struggle of critical race feminism. And further on, so always again, uh, LGBTQR plus uh, community so put the question about their own rights, which again have been somehow and differently in, in an intersectional uh, cont contact and dimension again suppressed compared with, and then they also struggle for their interests and they, with that pressure, they, how to say, contribute to widening scope of the inclusion, the process of inclusion into the feminist discourse of all those who have been discriminated. So that's the process, and it really, it currently, recently, maybe two, two or three weeks ago, one associate in Belgrade, one association, the feminist group and one LGBT group, they they struggled, they had conflictually, but at the end of the day, in process of, uh, of uh, how to say, uh, making bigger and bigger inclusion 
into the discourse and self-awareness has been going on. It does not mean that conflicts of interest between white women, black women, and all these groups which I mentioned or I did not manage to mention still will not be there. But the inclusion also in, into the discourse and practice and self-awareness has been going on as well. So feminist, feminist theories currently, third wave feminist theories, more, more and more converge in this inclusive approach. Transgender uh, included into gender-based uh, understanding of the, the reality more and more. So we have two more comments. Sheikh Ruben says, as Audre Lord says, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house, which makes the racial and patriarchal question very understandable. And Ivana says, thank you, Professor Guyadinovich. Now I guess the conflict is focused on trans people with all the existing stances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Depending where in the West more. Uh, context. But this, context yes. always again. And multiplication of conflicts and overcoming conflicts and inclusive processes. But always the pressure of the ma minority groups who struggle for their rights and recognition is there in order that those others acknowledge their, mm. their interests and include them into the discourse and practice. There is also a simple psychological moment that we shouldn't forget when such intersectional questions are before us, and we'll probably end with that. I can see Una is looking at the time. Oh, so naturally, yeah, okay. it's always the simplest to a person to understand and to relate to someone similar to them, be it a simple physical similarity, a, a woman to another woman, someone of the same race, or someone whom we perceive to be in a similar situation. So it's harder to understand someone whose experience is vastly different from ours, uh, not necessarily, I'm talking on the average. So that's where education helps, that's where uh, being aware of different cultures, different social situations also helps. Uh, but just as uh, we can uh, inadvertently not understand someone because uh, they're different, uh, such a situation can also be abused. For example, uh, if uh, I'm to judge uh, in a conflict uh, between uh, two people, I can always, if I'm corrupt and want to have it my way and want to favor someone, I can put it in a way that will make it uh, better. If, for example, Una and Nemanja are in a conflict, I can say, well, you know, positive discrimination, I'm going to recommend a woman for the job, and or I'm going to say, oh, he made a terrible chauvinistic comment, etc., etc. Now I'm simplifying things, uh, but it's very easy uh, to put something so it sounds good from a certain point of view to mask, in fact, something else. So many uh, fights for uh, the rights of an individual or a group that are based on very uh, real facts can also be abused for something else and we have to be wary of that. Uh, and just a final comment because even uh, uh, mentioned the focus on transgender people now, you might have read it in the papers nowadays, the increasing uh, cases in schools in the UK where parents are concerned because the, their children are allowed to socially transition to a different gender without the parents even knowing about it. So a teenage kid comes to class and says, well, you know, I no longer want to be a girl. I now want to be a boy. I'm going to come dressed as a boy, I feel like one, and please call me Jack, and so on. And the staff at the school is forced to uh, apply their legal rules, making them uh, obey what the pupil says is their gender identity. Uh, but then, for example, even not counting the question of how much we should uh, really base that on a young person's uh, current statement without any psychological assessment, etc., etc., you can look at the statistics, and there are many, many more 
biological girls claiming to be transgender boys than the other way around. So it's still a lot of young women feeling that they will be socially accepted better if they become men and now they don't necessarily need a surgical intervention for that. They can just say, I'm a boy now and my name is Jack. So there are a lot of underlying issues that we shouldn't ignore. Professor Wojdinovic. I just read uh, the comment to what you previously said concerning uh, a psychological, how to say, uh, uh, intentions towards understanding or feeling the other who is similar to us as ours. And but uh, here in this in this context, I think that's not primarily a matter of psychological approach or feeling, but much more. Definitely, it is a matter of political culture. Democratic political culture uh, tends, it does not matter that there are no uh, 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 different exa examples, but however, politic uh, democratic political cu culture, uh, political cu culture of, uh, in, of the inclusion of the liberative democracy, especially of constitutional democracy, has clear ideas about that no these kinds of affiliations have been the crucial ones, but the other is not an enemy in any sense and in, and in any scope. So citizens either being transgender or these or bi or binary persons or etc. etc. they are equal and equal concern for all of them. So no, though that's a matter of political culture. And uh, the quality of political order, not of these psychological dimensions. I agree. Ideally, I'm just not sure that there is a society on Earth right now where that is literally applied. Of course, of course, but that that's ideal. Typically, uh, that's not the mere construct. That's something based on the reality of the development of constitutional democracy and uh, deliberative inclusive democracy, but ideal typically it, it is something to what I think we should aim towards. But in, in the reality, nowhere maybe does not does exist, but that's uh, how to say the, sta the standard. Thank you very much. Do we have any other questions or comments? If not, thank you for your attention and we'll end here. Marathonski. <laughs>